Um, Recording in progress. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. It's good to see all of you. That it's even good to see the pictures of you that won't show your real face. <laughs> um. Anyway, um. Uh, hope everybody's doing okay. I um. <clears throat> Kind of might have a little something different on my mind tonight. Just kind of talking on a subject that I don't have really anything. I'm just shooting from the hip, you might say. I was thinking about it earlier today about um, and I was telling the Lord um, you know, I was talking to him. I was in my car going down the road, and I was just talking to the Lord. And I said, uh, you know, I was kind of playing the devil's advocate, if that's possible to do with the Lord. <laughs> but um, one of the reasons I have this on my mind is because it seems like to me that there's some in the body have sort of changed on our position on perfection. And um, uh, you know, when I was out in, when I was in uh, the religious world in Babylon, basically what they taught was is that if you just do the best you can do, you know, you're going to make it. Uh, I was talking to uh, someone that I know very well out there just recently, and they were just telling me what a grand reunion for our family it's going to be whenever the Lord comes. And, um, you know, so I had several thoughts going through my mind of, why I cannot, it, it seems like there's some men, in fact, I have talked to a few men that have just decided that there's, you know, there's no way to be absolutely perfect. You're just going to have to do the best you can do and God will grant you life. In fact, I was talking to a minister in the body not too long ago that told me he's quit believing in Matthew 27, 52 resurrection, that he believes in all the Old Testament worthies, that God just, he just counted them righteous because they were faithful and they're already in, they went to heaven. I, I couldn't hardly believe that with the teachings that we've had. So, you know, uh, if you go back thinking about Adam, that God created Adam uh, with a full knowledge. You know, we, we've got a very scarce um, account of what really took place in the garden. Of course, when you read, you know, when you get familiar with the whole Bible, you can ascertain what took place in the garden. Um, but just if you just read the book of Genesis, you'd have a hard time understanding it probably. But, you know, I've mentioned before that Adam was told that if he sinned, he would die. So for God to just, you know, say you, you do wrong and, you know, uh, your only hope is death. There's no indication that there was any repentance for that. When God removed him from the garden, he put up two cherubims and a flaming sword turning in every direction to keep the way of the tree of life or keep the way of the garden, and now least man 
put forth his hand and eat of the tree of life and live. Well, that um, uh, you know, I've mentioned before that there's no fence around the garden mentioned. And so you, you've got to understand that a lot of our uh, our writing in the in, in Genesis about the garden has to be symbolic. Some of it's symbolic, some of it is, has to be natural. For example, there God gave Adam the right to eat of the trees in the garden. Men didn't eat meat, they didn't kill, nothing got killed and ate in the garden. They ate fruit from trees. That was their feet, that was their food. Um but there was the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and there was a tree of life. Those trees are symbolic. There is no tree that you can eat of naturally that would give you knowledge of good and evil. That tree is, of course, Adam. Uh, and we could go through the Bible, and I don't think it's necessary to take a lot of time for that to show that trees in the Bible are symbolic of men. Um, Isaiah said we should be called trees of righteousness. Isaiah 61, John the Baptist came preaching that every tree that bring forth not fruit will be hewn down. He certainly wasn't talking about a lumberjack going through the land cutting down trees because it did if they weren't fruit trees. He was talking about people. If they didn't bear the fruit of righteousness, they would be judged. Um, you know, we could, we could talk a lot more about trees, that, but, uh, there were symbolic trees and natural trees in the garden. Um, but what, and, and I've said, and I'll go ahead with this thought that there wasn't any, there wasn't a fence around the garden. So Adam could have just walked around the two cherubims and the flaming sword, except they were symbolic, no doubt. There, there's nowhere on earth, we know basically where the garden was. There's no cherubims there, literally, and there's no flaming sword that's turning in every direction. That represents the, the, the old and new covenant of God, Christ, God and Christ that was in those covenants that you have to you have to pass before God and Christ is God's plan and a flaming sword that turns every direction. It don't miss anything. Mm -hmm. And so um, to, you know and I've said before most of you here locally know that I've said more than likely Adam slept in the same Bed that he slept in the night before he got kicked out. <laughs> that may sound a little bit um, facetious, facetious, but it. What my point is is that God put him out of the relationship that he was in. I don't think it necessarily had anything to do with the physical territory. It could have. I'm not. I wouldn't argue the fact, but. Um, you know what would keep what would keep him out the bottom line is he had no relationship with god after he sinned and the only way for man to get back in to this garden condition is to pass through the two cherubims and the flaming sword turning every direction so um and y'all, y'all can, I'll even open this up. I mean, I can open it up for questions as we go or even when I'm done, but, but, uh, uh, of course, one of the things that I, I want to, I'll, I'll mention is, um, um, I used it on, when I talked on Leviathan the other day, but I'll use it in a different 
um, aspect here tonight in Isaiah, and I will, I can, uh, Isaiah 26. Let me screen share at least that for right now. Um, Isaiah 26. That's going to be around 18, somewhere in there. Yeah, 19. Uh, here he says, thy dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. Now, uh, this is talking about, I mean, we could go back and read it and get the context, but it's talking about, Isaiah primarily is, is talking about uh, the coming of the Messiah. And this is talking about Matthew 27, 52, resurrection. Together with my dead body shall there rise. And you that awake you and awake and sing you that dwell in the dust for thy dew is as the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation is be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. So here God is going to judge the earth for its iniquity. And then in 27, he says, in that day, the Lord with his sword and great strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he'll slay the dragon that is in the sea. Um, here, this is this could be applied to the end of the Gentile world, but it's first talking about uh, the early church and the judgment in that church that ended in AD 70, and God uh, punished that dragon system back there and judged it. Um, you know, the same thing will take place down here. The book of Revelation gives us more insight on it for us down here. Um, but I don't know what you would do with this. You know, if you tried to make this say something besides what we're saying here is that, you know, there, there are now, I think you do need to understand that um, the convention center brethren do not believe in a Matthew 27, 52 resurrection at all. And um, so it's not, it's not that the body doesn't, you know, there's different, uh, there's different ways of looking at, at some of these scriptures. They're not, uh, they're not without a knowledge of the scriptures. It's just how they explain it. Uh, you know, so if, if you are, you know, saying your dead men shall live together with my dead body, that would have to be the body of Christ. But, you know, to stretch it to, that they that dwell in the dust, I don't really know how they explain this, but I can't explain it a different way, how that the earth is going to cast out our dead. Um, I mean, if you want to look at it as spiritual dead, you're going to have to sure symbolize it in a great deal. And then for this judgment to come, um, I just think we've got too many scriptures for that, for that resurrection back there. But I'm wanting to go back to my, my statement concerning um, the garden. Um, and I think the strongest verse is, and I've gave it to you before, but I'm just, you know, I want to rehearse it here a little bit. Uh, in Jude, I mean Joel, I'm sorry. Joel, the second chapter. Um, 
and and you know this is a easy scripture to use because we know that on the day of Pentecost Peter used uh, Joel's words and said this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel and so Joel's little prophetical book is was talking about the early church, and uh, when it came into existence on the day of Pentecost, and then these words are pretty strong. He says here, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, the day of the Lord. A day of darkness and gloominess, day of clouds and thick darkness, as spread as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong, there have never, there have not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it. Of course, I'm putting those that have never been a people like the early church, it's never been a people on the earth like that. And there's never been anybody since them. For many generations, he has not shall be after it, even to the years of many generations. So I think that that gives the inclination that after many generations, there will be another people like it, which is the restored church. Now he goes back to talking about them, the early church, a fire devoured before them, that's judgment, and behind them a flame burneth, still the same judgment. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them. There's a point that I've made pretty strong through the years that the early church was headed back into the Garden of Eden. And therefore, I believe the Garden of Eden is um, I think it's a picture of the holy place. In other words, the holy place um, I had a man write me, um, a minister, and asked me, he said, would you, would you give me some, you know, your thoughts on, on the tabernacle? And he was wanting to know, he said, you know, there's a lot of men in the body that believes that you can slip in and out of, of the holy place, slip in behind the veil. Some people think that's where you get the Holy Ghost. And he reminded me, he said, I don't think Brother Linegar bleed that that way. And uh, he said, I'd just like to hear what you have to say on it. Well, you know, I, I told him, I said, well, I, the Protestant movement to me restored the gate of faith. And, uh, you know, Brother Linegar used, he used, things faith humility the fear of god and honor is the four phases of that takes you to perfection and uh, the protestant movement starting with martin luther restored faith that was his message that just shall live by faith but um and then john and charles wesley they came behind him showing sanctification, that it took being set apart from the world. Just having faith in Jesus was not enough, but it took the humility of the brazen altar that you, when you go from the gate in and offer up your sacrifice, you have to you have to sacrifice your will. You have to humble down and recognize that God is in, he's in control and we have to give him our life. We have to realize he, we're his creation. He created us for a purpose, not for our will, but for his will. That's one of the things that I'm, I'm working on. I'm, I'm gonna, uh, on, on the love of God. Uh, I'm, I'm realizing that uh, agape love and, and filial love 
there's a whole lot more to agape love than what I really realized. Agape love includes, it, it includes all affection of man. It includes the affection of the wicked. I can show you scriptures where the wicked loved the sinners, loved one another uh, for, uh, you know, in other words, when, when a sinner paid you for doing something and you loved that, that, that you can look it up. It's a goppy love. That's a goppy love. Filial love really is French. It's really friendship type of love, more of, of affection and kindness and, uh, uh, but more, it's more used as a friendship. In fact, I'll give you a, set, a little setting of scripture that a little bit, a little bit shocking to you, probably. When Jesus asked Peter in Matthew 26, I believe it is, when he said, uh, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? And Peter said, and that love is agape love. And Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. That word that he used was phileo. Peter answered and said, Lord, I know you know I'm your friend. But he did not say, Lord, I love you with agape love. He said, Lord, you know I'm your friend. Jesus asked him the second time, did, lovest thou me, Peter? He answered in phileo, Lord, you know I'm your friend. This was after he denied the Lord. Peter's starting to realize how serious this thing is. And he was having a hard time committing to the type of love that he knew Jesus was wanting him to commit to. He asked him the third time. But the third time, he didn't ask him, lovest thou me? He said, Peter, are you my friend? That love was phileo love. It was not agape. Well, I'm just... I'm just showing you, you know, when you have, when you look at the, these scriptures, sometimes you really have to take a look at them because I think all of us probably at some point thought that that love was the same love they were talking about. You can look it up for yourself. It was not. Um, but let me get back. I don't want to get off track too far, but, um, but here, the, this, these people in, um, and, and the reason I'm bringing that up about love is because um, we have to be perfected in love. I talked on love in, in the last Zoom meeting I had, we had a little bit, and I had several men rise up against me because I made the statement that, you, you know, you're going to have to be perfected in love in the holy place. And a lot of men really rose up against that because they said, no, we can have charity now. Well, yes, I believe you can have faith now. I think you can have humility. Uh, of course, I'm working on meekness. I do believe meekness is a <laughs> virtue of humility. Um, but then the fear of God. Uh, th those two things there, I, you know, I mean, I, that's the gate of faith, that's faith and humility, uh, which I think are necessary virtues, the, the fear of the Lord. You're going to have to have some knowledge and some time to, uh, and here's the thing, I was, I was being, I was telling you, I was being the devil's advocate talking to the Lord about it. I said, God, if you gave Adam all the knowledge you know, in religion, they believe you're just going to fix everybody. So you fixed Adam, evidently, in the beginning. Uh, but how can God fix you? Even though God gave Adam knowledge, he wasn't fixed or perfected in it. He still had to go through experiences. He had to be tested. He had to be tried. He had to go through temptations, and he failed. Uh, and so uh, 
I don't see how God can just fix you where you can be. You know, I've said it over and over for, for God to God to just make you perfect without you experiencing perfection with knowledge and understanding and experience and trials and tests, then um, you wouldn't be you because you wouldn't have any, you don't have any, you wouldn't have any mind of the experience. Uh, even though Adam had the knowledge and the wisdom, he didn't have the experience. He wasn't tempered in. That's why he was in a garden. Like when Jesus was told, when he told the man on the cross, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. See, I always believed when I was in Babylon, that was heaven. But after I got here, I realized, hey, the guy wasn't ever even baptized in water. Must re you know, he never was even went through a salvation experience. He didn't go straight to heaven off of the death from the cross. but God could, the Lord could resurrect him because he could have got just on that cross. He could have uh, sincerely, with all the faith that he could muster, uh, believe and be justified by his faith that would grant him a resurrection. There in Matthew 27, 52, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. The day of the Lord, the whole time of the early church from the day of Pentecost to AD 70. Um, let's go back here. I hope, I hope if, you know, make you some notes if you want to ask me some questions or if I'm losing you, if I'm getting off track uh, too much, you know, you can get me back on track. Anyway, this fire devours before them, and Eden is before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. That's the falling away of the church. Um, after the early church, after God harvested that world, the church fell away, became a desolate wilderness. We've always taught that we're in the wilderness. We have to cross Jordan. We got to get in the land of Canaan, the promised land, which would be a restored church. One of the things that I think everyone ought to understand is, is that let's, let's take the early church. Just because the early church had um, a sevenfold light, the holy place was available, in other words. Um, that didn't mean you could get in it just because it was available. You had to go through a process to get in it. You had to, you had to, Copy in through faith. You had to humble down. You had to gain knowledge. You had to get enough fear of God. See, the more knowledge you get of God, the more you'll fear Him. And I'm I, I'm going to say that I, it literally uh, be afraid of God, be afraid of His power, be afraid of His righteousness. Uh, but not only afraid and scary in and being scared. I do think that's part of it, but all when you recognize the greatness of God and when you realize how far you are from being like him, that we are, that are, we ought to have a fear. We ought to have a fear of God that you know, we need his help. We certainly need God's help. And so, um, here, the church, they went, they, the garden of Eden was before them. In other words, it was available. But what I was saying was, is you, you've got to qualify to enter into the holy place. If you use the tabernacle as a picture of salvation, you're going to have to enter through faith. You're going to have to have humility and, and all the ingredients of what it takes to qualify to enter in. I don't think anyone ought to want to get in the holy place. If it's like the Garden of Eden and you commit one sin and you are eternally judged unworthy. And I'm sorry, but that's, that's how I see it. I see that for you to get into the holy place, Jesus lived in that place. Jesus never committed a sin. He lived, he was like the second man, Adam. 
Paul said. He lived without committing a sin. He was tempted. And that means he wanted to sin. You can't be tempted unless you really want to do something. You're not tempted if you don't want to do it. I mean, somebody said, if you hate bananas, they can shut you up in a closet full of them and you, you're not going to have any trouble <laughs> passing on eating, peeling one of them. Uh, you know, unless you just got, they left you in there long enough, you're starving to death and you said, I got to eat something. But uh, you get my point. You're not tempted with something that, that, that this doesn't tempt you. But when you're tempted, you want to do whatever it is that you're lusting after. And so <clears throat> yeah. it's when lust is conceived. Overcoming life is what it's sin saying. is is committed. So he never conceived it. He always was able to have it. He had his discussion, you know, no doubt in his mind with the with Satan when he was tempted 40 days and 40 nights. Can you hear me? Uh, you know, uh, no I doubt it went on in his heard. mind. Somebody's microphone's on, and when you talk, we can hear you. So everybody might want to check. I don't care if your mic's on as long as we, we don't get interrupted. But um, Okay, so here, the Eden was before them. Um, the, uh, to get back in that place, you're going to have to pass through a flaming sword turning in every direction. So in other words, if you're, uh, you, once you enter in, once you qualify to enter the holy place, it's a sinless place, but you're not perfect yet. Jesus wasn't perfect and he never sinned. Adam wouldn't. He, he wasn't perfect. He couldn't have failed if he was, but he lived in the garden for a significant period of time without falling. It's when he decided to go against God that he fell and God, God removed him from his fellowship, whether it was physically out of that garden or not. I don't know how God would have kept him out. I mean, it doesn't tell us everything. So you know, I guess God could have stuck him dead if he stuck one toe in there, but I don't think that's how it happened. Uh, let's see. Um, so here, here are these, these people, how does it say, and nothing shall escape them. In other words, that judge, that, that early church back there judged everything. Uh, uh, of course, those that rejected it were re, were judged, but but and then when you look at the the seven churches of Asia, that there was a requirement there of overcoming. You know, the the religious world would just say that just means be faithful to God, and you would rule and reign with God for a thousand years. I've often wondered if everybody that ever served God that was faithful goes to heaven in the rapture, what well, are they going to rule and reign over? You know, what would be a need for ruling over anything if, ever, if everybody made the bride? We didn't ask those questions when we were out there. They didn't, nobody presented them to us when I was out in Babylon. Um, and I mean, they do have answers, but they don't make a lot of sense. You know, they, they just, they don't, the puzzle won't fit. Um, he goes on here and says, uh, the appearance of them is the appearance of horses. You can use this scripture and prophecy to show that the, the white, red, black, and pale horses uh, that in prophecy, horses represent the church because their appearances as the appearance of horses and as horsemen, so shall they run. Revelation 19, Jesus comes riding on a horse and, and those that uh, were with him were called, were, uh, how does it say that they were uh, faithful? 
has all, what is the three things there that it says concerning um, uh, my mind slipping on that right now. It'll come to me probably in a minute. But anyway, they were on horses. They were on white horses. Anyway, like the noise of chariots on the top of mountains, shall they leap like the noise of the flame of fire and devour the stubble. And strong people set in battle array before their face, people shall be much pain. All faces shall gather blackness. They'll run like mighty men and they'll climb the wall like men of war and they'll march everyone on his ways and they shall not break their ranks. You know, that's, I think that's pretty good that they really is an order. There's an order in the body of Christ. Uh, you know, I've come through uh, 40 some odd years or almost 44 years in the body and I've seen a lot of things. I've seen, uh, you know, uh, Adam, it's very possible that Adam planted it, that he was the serpent that planted it in Eve's mind to eat the tree. And she ate it and gave it to him. If you symbolize that, that he loved her worship. He, he was powerful. He was had dominion over everything. And uh, she may have put, he may have planted it in her to put him on the throne of her heart instead of Christ. He may have usurped Christ's place in Eve's heart. And one of the reasons I say that is, is because and you look at the temptation that was in the garden where um, where Eve saw that the, the tree was good for food. She saw it was uh, pleasant to the eyes and one to make uh, one wise the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You look at Jesus' temptation, the 40 days and 40 nights that God put him on a fast, and he finally got so hungry that he said, if I be the son of God, I could turn these stones into bread and eat them. But then you know, he remembered the scripture said, thou shalt not live by bread alone by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And then Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, if you'll fall down and worship me, I'll give you all these, I'll give you all these kingdoms. I, I think that was no more than the temptation that Jesus realized how powerful he was. And he did have dominion. I mean, he could walk on water. He raised men from the dead. He healed blinded eyes. He, there was nothing that he couldn't do. Uh, I don't know how much of that was given over to his will. But just to me, it seems like it had to operate in by the will of his father in the spirit. But as long as he did that, he had dominion. Just like Adam had dominion over everything. Can you imagine when you're reading your Bible? I hope everybody's reading your Bible through, by the way. I want to keep emphasizing that because it is so important that you take some time. It don't take the 30 minutes a day. It don't even take that long, really, to read your Bible through in a year. Less than, I'd say, 20 minutes, you'd probably do it. Because my wife and I read two days at a time, and we do it in about 30 minutes. Because there's, you know, there's days that we don't, we don't read. Like Sundays, we normally don't read on Sundays. Uh, and then there's other days we just get caught up, or maybe we're traveling or whatever we're doing. And uh, so we miss some days. So we read two days at a time. And sometimes we get so interested in what's going on, we'll read two days and then we'll come back maybe that 
afternoon or evening and read read a little more because we want you know we want to get the rest of the story. You know, you heard who was that that used to say that? Now you know the rest of the story. I can't remember what that guy's name was right now. Um, uh, those words I was trying to think about, one of them is chosen and faithful. What was the one before that? They were, um, that aggravates me. Happens to you when you get older. I never Called, had this. Eh? Huh? Called? I'm not getting it. Called, chosen, and faithful? Called, that's it. Called, chosen, and faithful. Those were the, those on horses with him in the 19th chapter of Revelation were called, chosen, and faithful. Um, anyway, so, well, let me get back to where I was at. What was I saying? Uh, it was about Adam, I believe. Um, anyway, so um, the, these, these people, they operated in order. I know what I was going to tell you. I was going to tell you about being in the body so long that I've seen a lot of things. Brother Leninger used to say things to us once in a while to jar us to get back on track. He'd say, I hear some of you brothers using a minister's name 10 times more than you use Jesus's name. He'd jar us for that. He'd get on to us for that. Uh, what I was talking about was how Adam, he could have planted in Eve. This is what I wanted to say was that Jesus realized he could build his own kingdom. That was the ad adversary in his mind. He realized with his anointing and with the power of God that he had, he could have built his own kingdom. And he was tempted to do that, to fall down and worship. The adversary, it would be adverse against God to go against the adversary and build his own kingdom. And that bothers me even to this day. When I see men, I saw this. I was in a I was in the body of Christ and working under a great man many years ago. That I saw this man plant in his people to call his name and lift him up above Christ. And I saw the man fall in that, but I saw that man put planted in the people and began to build it, his own kingdom. And he, he had a big church. And uh, so I was in that. I, I, I was even tempted with that. Uh, you know, I remember I even told the man, I said, you know, we're <clears throat> these young men that are, that get behind this and pushing it. His answer to me was, is that people need to have a leader that they have confidence in. Well, I'll agree with that, but I don't think we need one we have to worship. And I don't think we ought to be lifting men up above Jesus Christ. And I think we ought to recognize that we don't even have men like the early church had yet. I think we're 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 pushing it too far to try to say that we got what the early church had. Uh, that that uh, that was the lust of the eyes for Jesus to see spiritually what he could build in building his own kingdom, and then the pride of life. Uh, one this tree is one that would make one wise. Uh, when he was he in the pinnacle of the temple, he evidently in his mind uh, thought about that. And if I was in a really high place, I could I could jump down. And and the scripture said I wouldn't dash one foot against the stone. 
the angels would bear me up. At least I dash my foot against a stone. That's the pride of the temptation of who I am, that nothing can hinder me. I'm above, you know, I'm, I'm higher in higher regard than, than others. Uh, so, but, so they'll not break their ranks. I think that's important for us to realize that we've got a place in God to work and we don't go outside of that place. We don't, we don't try to operate in an area God didn't ask us to operate in, but we, we do operate in the rank that God gives us to operate in. Neither shall one thrust another. And that wouldn't that be wonderful if nobody would kill anybody in here? Nobody will, nobody will run you down. Nobody will, uh, dip, you know, uh, slander your name or no, you know, people will be careful. Sometimes you have to. It, it is true that you have to deal with reality, but you do have to be careful about how you deal with reality, especially when you're dealing with chosen men of God and even people of God because uh, God, you know, God knows the heart. And sometimes uh, a person has a heart, but they don't have, their spirit hasn't reconciled with their heart altogether. And God, God watches all that. And yeah, you have to be careful about, you know, Paul said, you can't judge another man's servant. You, 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 you got to be careful about judging God's people. You can judge sin. You can say what's right and what's wrong with the word of God, but you can't judge a person because, you know, what you saw them do a year ago or what you heard that they done a year ago, they may already got that fixed with God and, and you could do them damage. And, uh, you know, I've, I've learned that working with ministers and, and uh, especially like in the Dominican Republic, you know, I've had men over there that are, that are exalted and, you know, they see a man that, that maybe, you know, maybe he did something that he shouldn't have done and they want to hold it against him for 10 years. <laughs> but and I wouldn't let them, you know, I've had them try to put some men out of the ministry and I wouldn't let them do it. Uh, you know, what, what the Bible tells us to restore a brother in the spirit of meekness, least we fall, you know, least we be tempted. Because you will, you'll go through things in life. Anyway, uh, so when we get back, um, They'll everyone, they'll walk, they shall walk everyone in his path. And they, and when they fall on the sword, they won't be wounded. In other words, the word of God will not wound you because you won't, it won't judge you because you will obey it. So the word of God won't, won't, won't be coming against you. You fall on the sword, it won't even hurt you. You can apply it to your, you can apply it to you if you're, if you're righteous and it's not going to judge you, there's no judgment where there's no sin. There's no judgment. They'll run to and fro in the city and they run upon a wall and climb upon the houses and enter in at the windows like a thief and the earth will quake before them and the heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon will be dark and the stars will withdraw their shining. That's talking about when, when their judgment judges that world and, uh, you know, the lights are going to go out uh, on on just like it went out on Judaism, and uh, back there, uh, and uh, on that dragon system was judged back there, and they didn't have a place in heaven anymore. You know, in the twelfth chapter of the book of Revelation, they were a war. There was a war in heaven, and the dragon got kicked out. There again, you know, he, he didn't get kicked out of third heaven or, sec, or second heaven. He never got in second heaven, but he was in first heaven warring against 
the body of Jesus Christ back there in the early church. That was Judaism with empowered by Rome. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, and his camp is very great, for he strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Um, how does it say that in Malachi? No, I'm going to try to. I don't know if I'm getting all my points across here, but I, I, I will open it up for questions or, or uh, uh, comments even. Some of you brothers or any of you want to comment. Well, uh, I know it's... Um, let me, I'm just going to look for the scripture right here. Well, maybe, I mean, that was part of what I wanted to read, but. I'm wanting the scripture here in Malachi where it says, who can abide? Is it um, Malachi 3, 2, but who may abide the day of his coming? Yeah. I said, Bill, I'll send my messenger. I was John the Baptist. He'll prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant who you delight in. Behold, he'll come, saith the Lord of hosts, but who may abide the day of his coming? And who'll stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. You know, uh, and he shall set as a refiner and purifier of silver and shall purify the sons of Levi. That's the ministry and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. That then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant to the Lord in the days of old as in the former years. And I'll come near to you in judgment. So God, he is going, you know, he is, this was talking about the early church, of course, but it goes rather wrong with these other scriptures. Uh, here's where the book of remembrance was written to them that feared the Lord and thought upon his names. And it says, and they'll be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. That has to be Isaiah 61.10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with garments of salvation and hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorned herself with her jewels. This is um, the day when I make up my jewels. Those, that's his bride. Mm -hmm. Uh, that he made up bride members in the early church. Um, so for here, chapter four, for behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall, stub, shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healings in his wings and he and you shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall and shall tread down the wicked and they shall be ashes, ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord. So... Um, Remember you the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded to him and Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgment. Behold, I'll send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he'll turn the heart of the fathers, the children, the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So God did send John the Baptist 
And you all have heard me on the Elijah ministry that started back there with him and is still going on today. That Elijah ministry is still intact. Anyway, uh, if anyone wants to comment or have a question, I'm open. Brother Smith, mm -hmm. in uh, Romans 8, um, Paul works through that, in Romans 8, 28, down through uh, 37, uh, through verse 39. He implies that it is God that justifies. And it makes me wonder if some of our ministers don't uh, take that as being that God perfects um, before the rest restoration of the, of the church. So if you if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to hear you, hear hear you speak on specifically verse um, thirty, and then uh, I think verse thirty three he uses justified and justified. Uh, verse thirty. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called he also justified, then he justified, them he also glorified. Well, I don't see God predestinating individuals, but I do see that God predestinated a plan that there would be uh, those that would serve him unto perfection. He predestinated a plan that would accomplish that. And them he also called, and those that he called, he justified, of course, uh, we're justified by our faith. That's what justifies us as we continue. And of course, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so it takes greater knowledge of the word of God that will continue to justify you. In other words, to him who much is given, much is required. So the justification has to move. In other words, God, you may be, you know, someone that just comes to God in repentance and are, you know, decides uh, uh, and they make a commitment to live for God and they are baptized in water, repent of their sins, receive the Holy Ghost. That faith, ju they're justified. But it's like I've said about the called, chosen, and faithful. The way you are faithful and chosen is by being called. But the first thing you have to do is you have to answer the call. And, I, and when you get saved, you have to say, yes, Lord, I will, I will serve you. I will yes. repent of my sins. Mm -hmm. I have done wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I will yield. I, I, I feel you dealing with my life. I, I see you're asking me to to, uh, you know, give up my will and enter into your purpose and your plan. And so my answer to your calling is yes. When you first do that, you don't know what all God's going to ask you to do. Uh, but you're chosen at that point. When you say yes, he chooses you. God accepts you right then. And that justifies you. Uh, and and as long as you keep saying yes, but when God takes you to another level and says, I want you, I'm going to require more of you. I'm, I'm not going to let you stay where you're at. You're, I'm going to require a, a greater dedication to me. I'm going to show you some things you've done wrong, that you're doing wrong, and you have to give them up. Because you're going to have to be more righteous than what you are. And you have to say yes. If you say no, there's where you quit being called. There's where you quit being chosen and you're no longer faithful. But as long as you keep saying yes, as you grow and God continues to justify you, uh, he goes on here and said, what shall we say? Then say to these things, if God be for us, who can be against us? He spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? 
Well, that just applies to us just like it did to Jesus. He gave Jesus everything, but again, Jesus was not perfect. He lived in the holy place or in the garden, but he wasn't perfect. Not but He had to get into a place that he had enough power to live above sin for God to finish his work in him. That's what I was saying here recently about the love of God, charity. See, you, you can use this word agape a lot in a lot of ways. I mean, the world, it's whatever your, in fact, the word in comparison to the Old Testament for agape is lust. See, but you can have a righteous, you can lust mm -hmm. after the things of God. It's what your the seat of your affection desires. And of course, if it's if it's the the righteousness of God, because uh Hebrews 2 there Paul said because talking about um God saying to Jesus, because thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. See, he that was a, that became the seat of his affection. You could have the same agape love for something that's wrong. Uh, I you know I could I I could show you some scriptures. I'm I'm, I'm working on it here. Let me let me just give you one right quick. Mm. Let me give you a, a agape love here. Woe unto you, Pharisees, for you love the uttermost seats in the synagogue. That love right there is agape love. Same love as charity. Same love as Peter, lovest thou me? It's the same love. Um, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Many men love the world. It's the same love, agape love. It's the seat of your affection. The phileo love is more of a friendship type love. It's more a love of kindness. It's a love of, uh, you know, acquaintance where you're, you're drawn to someone because you there. like their uh, the character, that character, their characteristics. Uh, okay, let me get back here. Uh, verse thirty: Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Well, so you—that's what I was saying earlier. You got to be careful about judging one of God's children because you don't know what is in that person's heart you don't know they may have just done wrong yesterday but they have may have fell on their face and repented of it since and you don't know what's in that person's heart but God does he's the one that justifies them and it has to do with their heart their God is judging our hearts Yes, our spirit, our behavior, all of that enters in to God's judgment, but God's, you know, that old saying, God's not finished with me yet, <laughs> you know, uh, but again, I don't think any of us want to go into the garden condition or the holy place if we haven't grown to a place, and you you don't have to worry about uh you don't have to worry about slipping in there. <laughs> I don't think we got brother William Souders taught the Pentecostal movement was in the labor. And he, in my opinion, he was right. I don't think anybody has ever went behind the veil and got the Holy ghost or goes behind the veil and gets a little touch and slips back out. I don't see that happening. I, I think that's the labor that that's, you know, the spirit of God, is it is working it worked in the old testament it worked it works in the first heaven you'd never get saved if the spirit of god wasn't there but god justifies us from the point of salvation now when i'm saying you have to be perfected in love 
the love of God, the love of righteousness, God's character, God's likeness. Um, I don't think that is a finished work till you get in the garden uh, or in the holy place, but I think you can have a measure. Yes, you can have a measure of charity right now. I mean, you can, you can have a measure of knowledge. You can have a measure of understanding, a measure of wisdom. You can get a measure of it, but, but I don't think you can get perfected in the love of God until you get in the holy place. It's going to take a sevenfold light. It's going to take unleavened bread of the word of God for you to achieve that. If our teaching on perfection, that was what I was trying to tell you all earlier, that in being somewhat the devil's advocate is, can we be perfect without really being perfected? Can we just be faithful to God, do the best we can do? And, and God counts us worthy of eternal life just because we're faithful people. And, and then God realizes, I think God does realize. That's why I think you will come up in the just resurrection if God realizes that you are, you've said it in your mind, you're going to serve God. And you've proved it over many years of being faithful to God. You may have hit some bumps. You may have fell a few times and had to get up and sh shake the dust off your feet or, you know, brush yourself off and, and make another stab at it, but you're still in the game. Uh, but I don't have, I'm having, I, I, I'd have, I cannot get to a place where this is less than our, our, um, what we've always said when we've always said we're still in the wilderness and we got to cross Jordan. We got to have a restored church and get into the promised land. And then we got to overcome in the promised land. I don't think we can just throw us over in there. You know, if we're in, if we're, if we've been in a wilderness of, a, of, you know, uh, and, and we're not, we're not in a restored place. And we don't have a ministry that's given us a sevenfold light yet. I think we've got, I think God's gave us, I think Jesus, let me say this. I think Jesus has, he is our mediator. He, he is giving us light from that holy place, the sevenfold light. That, that's symbolic. That's in Christ. He, he has all the truth, all the understanding. He gives us measures of that as we grow and as he, and he justifies us by what he gives us and by what, how we respond to it. So you could be, you, 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 uh, God's the one that's in charge of his elect and he justifies us by you know, and I've said this before, used to when I was a younger minister and I preached a message and I, I could tell that there were people in the congregation that was getting what I was saying. Well, back when I was younger, I was I thought they're, God's going to hold them responsible for this message. They got to come up with it. That's not true. You, just because you get an understanding of something, you, you got, that's got to get welded inside you. You've got to get to where you really, that becomes a part of you. It's, in other words, when, when God gives you a little bit of understanding, it's like you digested. But it's going to take a while for your body to take what you digested and make it a part of you cellularly. It's going to become a part of your body, your cells. And it's, the, it's that way with the word of God. Just because God shows you something don't mean that you are you are you have achieved that. Sometimes it takes, it may even take a few years for God to fix you in certain understanding that he gives you. God knows that. He understands that just because you understand it, you got to figure out how to put it into 
you got available, you got to figure out how you're going to put this into your, okay. your life, into your walk, into your behavior. You can't just do that overnight. You can't just decide I'm going to be righteous. It takes time for righteousness to develop in your spirit in, and become a part of your character. I'm not giving you a crutch. I'm not giving you an excuse not to obey what you know and what you understand because you've got to strive. That's why he said, blessed are they that mourn. They'll be comforted. You got to, you got to continue to be crying out to God. You know, God help me do this. Help me to answer your call. Help me to keep, uh, stay in a place where you can keep justifying me. Anyway, uh, so he goes on there and said, who is he that condemneth? Is it Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen? Who is he uh, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, or persecution, or famine, or naked, or peril, or sword? For it's written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for slaughter. Nay, and all these things were more than conquerors through the Lord, or through him that loved us. Well, when you're reading this, you, one of the things you got to remember is you're reading the man that's, that's talking from a divine order of God that's got more light. And, and he, he's proved it in his life that by the grace of God, nothing can take me away from God. No temptation, no tribulation, no distress, no famine, no persecution, no peril or sword. He said, I'm persuaded neither death or life or angels, principalities, power, things present, things to come, neither height, our depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is Christ Jesus, our Lord. Okay, let me end this thing and give you all a little bit of, because I can feel that I'm putting pressure on people just with this talk. So let me give you a little help. You can't do any more than what God's asking of you. And you can't do any more than where God has brought you to. You can rest in that and you can know that as long as you're doing all you know to do, let me qualify that because every one of us know something probably that we're not doing that we ought to be doing. But if you know that I'm doing all that I'm really capable of doing, even though I know I can see I can see far enough ahead to know that God wants me to increase and do better. And as long as you're faithful, it, it, you cannot make yourself perfect. Only Jesus can do that for you. All you can do is be called, chosen, and faithful. Just keep answering the call with a, with a yes. You'll keep being chosen. You'll remain faithful and God will finish his work in you. It's he, it, He's the only one that can do it. There's not one of us that knows the way to perfection for our character, for us individually. So you've got to trust the Lord, and you've got to believe that is, if I'll serve him and do the best I can and be as faithful, you know, and, and keep telling, mean, I keep telling God, I want to do, help me to do anything I'm not doing that you want me to do. That's my heart. That's my spirit. And uh, I have to rest in the Lord and know that he's the one that's going to have to accomplish this in me. He's the one that's going to have to keep, keep justifying me. He's the one that's going to have to keep leading me into perfection. We call it perfection. So anyway, I've already, I started this out thinking, I'm not even sure what I'm going to talk about tonight, but I had some of this on my mind, but you know, you know how it is, the preacher gets started, he can't shut up hardly, so I better quit, hadn't I? Anyway, uh, I'll stop sharing here, and uh, 
if anybody's got any more um, comments or questions, we'll uh, go ahead with them. Can I ask a question? Sure. I've heard some ministers say that we have this Holy Ghost inside of us and that we have the power because we have the Holy Ghost inside of us. That we can do it now. No. Yeah. Well, um, I'll answer that this way. When you're born of the Holy Ghost, it's a birth of that, of the nature of God. Same nature that was in Christ. And the same way when you're born naturally. When you're born naturally, you can't do everything. You can't do what an adult can do. You've got to grow and you got to develop and it, it takes gaining. You've got to, you, number one, you, your body's got to develop to where it's capable of doing whatever, whether it's walking or whatever. Um, but you got to have a mind. Your mind is, is your vehicle of behavior. And if your mind doesn't have the knowledge, in the same way with the Holy Ghost, when you're born of the Spirit of God, you don't know everything. If, 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 if it was true that because we have the Holy Ghost that we're capable, then why when we got the Holy Ghost, we didn't get a sevenfold light and all the knowledge with it? But we didn't. And so we, we have to be, how did Paul say it? Be ye renewed in the spirit of your mind. How do you say, be not conformed to this world, but be conformed. Um, how do you say that? Let's see. Be transformed. Be by transformed the by the renewing of your mind that you might prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So it takes renewing your mind from a fallen, carnal, corrupt life that you've been brought up in, man, just a few days and full of trouble. And so you're going to, your mind is going to have to begin to get the knowledge of God and his righteousness, the understanding of it. You're going to have to go through experiences and, temp and be tempered in that. And so you got to grow and develop your mind. Your mind is the vehicle for the Holy Ghost nature. Like, okay, so your mind is the vehicle for your Adamic nature. But when you renew your mind and you realize the Adamic nature is wrong in its thinking, when you learn more about God and you overcome those thoughts, you're killing that Adamic nature and you're overcoming it. And you're beginning, like I quoted that scripture in Hebrews, where uh, Jesus said, I mean, where God said to Jesus, because thou lovest righteousness and hatest iniquity. How? How did Jesus get to a place that he loved righteousness and hated iniquity when he was a little babe wrapped in swaddling clothes? He had to grow up. He had to learn. He had to gain knowledge of God. God had a responsibility. That was his son. His only creation. He had a responsibility to rear him up right, teach him right, put him through whatever he had to put him through and develop him. You know, so, but here we're of the human race. We have to be born again of God. And then we have to take wherever that started in salvation. And then we've got to gain knowledge. We've got to get our minds renewed. That's why I've said, you know, if God just fixed it where you would be righteous, then you won't be you. He's going to change your whole mind for him to change you where you understood righteousness and would do it. See, God would have to make you into a, what he's not going to do. He'd have to make you into a puppet where you, you know, and if that's true, why didn't God just make us all that way anyway? 
Well, he didn't because he don't want a, a everlasting life full of puppets that has to serve him and do righteously. He wants a family that chose righteousness, learned it, and was perfected in it. They, he wants children like him. That yes, we understand wickedness and we understand righteousness and we chose the righteous over the wicked and God helped us to do that from the fall. God, God had that in his plan that he would he predestinated like that scripture some. So it's ludicrous to believe that just because you have the Holy Ghost, you're, when you get the Holy Ghost, you're, you're just like a little bitty infant that has no mind or vehicle to carry that Holy Ghost nature into doing righteously. That's got to be developed. We have to develop that by the renewing of our minds. So men that make those kind of statements haven't thought that through very well, in my opinion. Uh, it just seems like to me some men are trying to make it a lot easier to go to heaven than sticking with the message of perfection. And I'm sorry, I can't make it easy for you. What I can do is tell you, if you'll do your part, God will do more than his. He'll, he'll remember the, his, your, you know, the, par, the prodigal son, the, that, that parable, the father went running to him when he came home. You know, he, he was coming home with his head ducked down, but it pleased God so much. The father, the picture there, he was running toward his son and said, kill the fatted calf. Get things ready. Our son, my boy's coming home. Well, God loves his children, and he knows how to develop us and take us into perfection. The thing is, is we have been in a, uh, we've been in a wilderness state, in a fallen state, of, and God has had to take us through that or we would have never been able to maintain a restored church. You see, when God gets us in a restored church, we're going to know all about a wilderness condition, all about a fallen condition, all about darkness, false religion, babbling. I mean, we've rehearsed that over and over. God had to bring us through all that. Once he gives us a restored church, uh, things will change and it'll change rapidly because it'll be God's time, just like in the early church. You know, the Jews for 2000 years, they were, they were, they missed it a hundred miles. But when Jesus came and the day of Pentecost came, I mean, that Joel too is a beautiful picture of that early church. Judgment came rapidly. I mean, they never seen an Ananias and Sapphire get struck dead just because they lied in the church house. I've often said, we got people in the church that's done a lot worse than Ananias and Sapphire, and they ain't even got a slap for it. But when the restored church gets here, things are going to change, and people are going to get serious about serving God in a greater fear and awe of him. Again, if you'll just rest in the Lord, be where we're at, be content where you're at in God and just serve him to the best of your ability. And that's all you can do. The rest is his job. The rest is the Lord's place. All right. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know what to call this. I, I can, I don't know what to label this. <laughs> I will put this on WhatsApp, on our WhatsApp group the recording so anybody can watch it and I'll send it to y'all and uh, that are not in the group. Uh, but I don't know what to label it. I've been trying to label these messages. I guess I'll just la label it. Uh, what about perfection? What about our vision of perfection? Something like that. That's really, I guess what I'm talking about, but, Anyway, I'm just throwing out a bunch of thoughts at you and trying to help you to understand why I cannot lessen what I make it less, let make perfection less than what we've taught it in the past and what our forefathers gave to us about it. I can't, I can't, 
I can't gainsay that message. It's, it's there's too many scriptures. Uh, you do anything with it. Anyway, God bless y'all. Uh, before we go, let's pray. I know, Brother Painter, you want to say something about the losses of the families this week that you've had uh, at Lafferty, your employees' families? Yes, sir. We've, uh, it's, you know, it's just families that have been struck with either COVID related or uh, bad health. It's primarily bad health plus COVID. And we've had three families that have been impacted at Laffrey, which is 10% of our workforce. So I'd, if you would just remember those families, I don't care to mention their names, but we, I do yeah. have your prayers on that. Yeah, we are having this, this surge, you know, and so I still believe God's talking. I feel like God's certainly in charge of this. We don't have all the answers yet, but I do feel like we ought to be wise and, and um, you know, and then we do need to pray for everyone that are being, you know, that's being affected by this pandemic. There's still people dying with it. Uh, I think there was, I think I saw in the news today, I think, was it 18 deaths today in Arkansas? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, they're just the they're, numbers are just escalating as far as how many people is going to the hospital, how many people are, uh, you know, uh, getting it. Uh, and and then those that are sick in there so we need to we do need to really pray for these families um there you know what's happening with our economy this is gonna this is gonna affect our economy it already is but because it's like right now they're they're forecasting there's going to be a shortage in grocery stores uh and it's not because they don't have the they don't have the the uh products it's because they don't have enough employees employees are sick they're down on employees they're not able to make as many products they can't get anybody to ship them they can't the stores the shelves are you know half empty because they they can't get the product it's not that the manufacturers can't make it they don't have their short on employees another painter was showing he's He's short on about 10% of his staff. The, it's that way everywhere. And what's happening with that is your, your manufacturers are having to charge more for the products to stay afloat because they still have their expenses. Um, and uh, I mean, it's, it's amazing. I was just recently at the car dealership where I bought a, a new car last year, there, there was three cars on the lot on the entire big lot that used to have maybe 500 cars on that lot, maybe more than that. There's three cars. There was two pickups and a Jeep on the lot. They can't get them. Therefore, used cars have went up 37% in the last 12 months. Four, almost 40% increase in cars. Gasolines went up. Everything's going up. So it's going to affect our economy. Um, our, um, we had a 7% increase in inflation this year, last year in America. That's the greatest increase we've had since the 80s. So, it, you know, uh, I'm just going to tell you, God can cause this country to get on their knees if he wants to. And, and you would think that people would, would, would get more serious with God, but it, they, hadn't got, they hadn't got serious enough yet. And, and God may just keep working. And just remember, God's people is not always exempt all of God's righteous people in Judah and Israel wound up in Babylon because of the wicked. 
And uh, so God's righteous suffers with this many times. And then judgment first has to happen at the house of God. So, so let's, let's, you know, let's remember everyone that this is affecting and try to have mercy and prayer for them. Uh, keep praying for those that we've been praying for, Bill Daniels, Brother Weaver, uh, Brother, uh, Brother Lewis's grandson, he's not doing well. Shane Clifford has had some improvement. He's, they may start trying to wean him off the vent if he keeps improving tomorrow. Um, so anyway, these uh, brother, brother Rodriguez in, in Brownsville, he's got people in Brownsville with COVID. He's got people in Rio Bravo with COVID. He's got people in Mission, Texas with COVID. Um, they've got several cases of COVID. None of them got COVID from the church. They're just getting it. It's easy to get this Omicron, evidently. So I'm myself, I keep forgetting. I went in the grocery store today and uh, I forgot to put on my mask before I went in because we kind of got lax with that. But I'm trying to remember to get the mask back on, you know, uh, because this thing's evidently pretty easy to get. So anyway, uh, I will mention it is supposed to snow Saturday. Sister McNabb, Sister Angela, don't y'all laugh, Sister Judy, because it's they're they're really telling it real strong on the yeah. weather. I mean, it's possible we may get one, even could be three inches, but it'll be 40 the next day. But they're really telling us about the bad weather that's coming. And uh you know, they're, they're in Canada. Y'all, I don't know, but y'all probably have six six inches on the ground right now. And it'll stay there probably till April. Anyway, but anyway, we're from the South. We don't like all that. You know, we don't, we're not geared up for it. So, but, but when it comes, listen, when it comes to three inch snow here, it's dangerous. People don't know how to drive. There's all kinds of wrecks. They don't put sands. They don't salt the roads down hardly at all, just the bridges. So, uh, I mean, the safest thing you do is just get on a bridge and stay there. <laughs> if you're not going to be at home. Anyway, I'm just going on. But, Brother but, Smith? Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, Could I ask for prayer for this weekend? Uh, the 16th is Sunday. It's a year since Brother McNabb passed. Yes. Yes. I know. Hard. For my daughter it. too. She's really feeling it right now too. Uh, yes, let's remember that. Also, brother Goss is not doing well. We need yeah. to keep praying for the brother Goss and his family and the church at Keswick. So remember those things. Uh, I guess if everybody just raise your hand if you got prayer request, and we'll just unmute our phone, our our microphones right now, and let's ask the Lord to. To, um, to help us with these many needs. Precious Lord, oh God, help us here tonight. Yes, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, God, I thank you for your love. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. 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 Praise God.
It's so beautiful. Thank you. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you. Hallelujah. 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 Hallel